Okay, as mentioned, we are jumping back into our uh, series. We're in John chapter 20. We're in part 50. Let's go, part 50. <laughs> uh, what a privilege it has been to spend so much time in this book. And again, I want to thank you for your heart that is open to the Word. And this is a great place to be. And Lord bless you for that. If you've been with us, you recognize that in this section of Scripture, we are now post resurrection, where Jesus is now revealing himself to various people. And this morning, we're going to see, I'm just going to pull together three points, um, three things that I want us to look at. Uh, first would be that how Jesus meets us in our doubts. He did it for them, and he also does it for us as well. We're going to see how Jesus helps us through our fears and what that means for them and what that means for us. We're also going to hear an invitation to believe, and the whole book is culminating in these chapters and then the postscript, which we'll get to the next couple weeks. And so that's where I'm going this morning. And so I'm going to read the passage in its entirety, okay, I'm going to read it in one chunk. We're going to circle back, and I'm going to try to tie some things together. So if you have the notes today, and they're out there, or they're um, online, you just go to our website, download them. That's going to be helpful to you to see some of these things, and as we tie them together, and looking at who Jesus is, what he does, what he's doing. Okay, so this is John 20. We're jumping in the second half of this chapter, starting with verse 19, and we're going to read all the way down to 31. So John 20, starting with verse 19. On the morning of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father had sent me, I now am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, well, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to buy it. I'm not going to believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas, at that point, was with them. Now, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hands and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, now because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, the book of John. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus, of course, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. It's an amazing passage. Is that last verse somewhat familiar to you? Never heard it before. We finally come to it after 50 weeks of walking through this book. So Jesus 
meets us in our doubts. Don't you like that? <laughs> Jesus doesn't run away people that have doubts, and perhaps in your life you are doubting, is this story true? Or perhaps along your journey in this life you wondered because there's some fantastic things contained in these scriptures. Jesus doesn't cower away from people who have questions or having trouble to believe, but he draws near to them. I like that about Jesus, right? Meets us in our doubts. Doesn't wait till we fully believe and then to show himself. He comes to us. And this is abundantly clear in our passage for today and actually extending to this whole chapter. Now it was pointed out to me, Tom pointed out to me this week, that there is a progressive um, uh, there's a progressive level of doubts in the four people or four groups of people in this chapter. And I want us to look at this, okay? In recognition that the goal of the book of John in particular is to reveal Jesus to us so that you and I can make a decision as to who this man really is. Is he a fraud? Is he a liar? Is he a holy man? Is he a moral teacher? Or is he being Beyond that is he the Christ, the Son of God, with the hope that you and I would believe. After the resurrection, Jesus now is appearing, and John, I think, uh, intentionally, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then leads us to four different people that we can see how God meets us in our doubts. Now, the first one we saw last week, okay, so I'm tying these together. This is about John the Beloved. If you remember this in John 20, 1 through 9, that John believed in Christ, but he wasn't there on the resurrection. And John, just seeing the evidence as he walked into the tomb, there's this, uh, in verse 8 of chapter 20, it says about John, and John's writing it says, and I believed, I believed that Jesus rose from the dead. It said he saw and believed. So this is someone who has knowledge, an intimate knowledge of Jesus after seeing the evidence, believed. And that is one category of people. They just are so hungry and want to know that they look at the evidence and it's like, mm, this has got to be true. And this was John the Beloved. Now, the second person we run into in this chapter is a lady named Mary Magdalene, and you have to love her, right? She was heartbroken. She loved Jesus, but she was having trouble believing in this resurrection. She went to the tomb, as we read last week, and saw the evidence and was like, where's the body? She was terrified. She was scared, ran back to the, uh, the apostles, the disciples, where they were. They ran back to the tomb and saw it. And then Mary came back still wanting to know and not believing that Jesus indeed was resurrected. Jesus, in his goodness and in his grace, if you remember this, had angels show up that she can see the supernatural because she was acquainted with the supernatural in a negative way. And then Jesus called her name Mary. And she knew because she knew the name and that personal interaction with the risen Lord caused her to believe even though she had doubts. Jesus still does that today, calls us by name and shows himself as the risen Lord. Now, the next group of people that we run into, and so we have John the Beloved, we have Mary Magdalene, and then we see this group called the Disciples. And these disciples are gathered together behind locked doors, and it says Jesus stood among them. This is John 20, 19. 
So he spoke to them, and he showed them the evidence, his hands and his side, that he was alive. Now, when the disciples and this group context, perhaps even like a church service, Jesus' presence was there, the evidence was there, he spoke to them, they saw collectively that this was the Lord. They heard his voice. They knew he was present. And they were overcome with joy. Even though they still had their doubts. They were scared and rightly so. And even though they had their significant questions, Jesus met them as a group of people. And they believed after seeing and experiencing his presence with them. Sometimes we see that in our world as well. Well, God will show up to a group of people, be it in his presence by his spirit, be it in the spoken word, be it in God working and turning our minds and hearts towards him. These things happen now as well. And then, of course, the last person we run into is this guy named Thomas, right? He was indeed one of the disciples. He did have a working knowledge of Scripture, and he knew Christ and experienced some of the miracles and heard him talk, but yet he still had trouble. Right? Even after the other disciples saw him, Perhaps Thomas was more of an intellectual person. Perhaps he was more of a, um, a self-processor and needed time alone to try to unravel his thoughts. He wasn't there for whatever reason. Jesus showed up, and then these friends of his, right, people that he'd known, traveled with for at least three years, said, hey, Thomas, you would not believe this. Please believe this, Thomas. Right? We saw the and even in that testimony, right, he was like, yeah, boy, I don't know, I'm going to need more. <laughs> right? right? There's perhaps people in your life who are like that. I know about Jesus, perhaps grew up, perhaps even in this church. Right? They know a lot about Jesus, but they have not yet taken this step to believe who he is. This, by the way, should give us some hope for those people. Maybe they're just in between the week, between Jesus showed up the first time and when he speaks to them personally. Right? Thomas, the holdout. Thomas, who needed evidence. Thomas, after interacting with Jesus as he met with them. By the way, after a week, which is curious, why take so much time? Well, I think because he knew that Thomas needed some time to further process things. Jesus knows, by the way, when to appear. Jesus knows when to speak. Jesus knows when to reach us. And for us, that time is yesterday, or 10 years ago, or 50 years ago. This should give us hope for even the hardest skeptics and those who have not yet believed. This helps us. So in this passage, as John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is talking about these encounters that took place from those who had the greatest amount of faith but yet doubted, and those who had a significantly low amount of faith and really doubted, Jesus stepped in and connected with each one of them specifically, powerfully, and profoundly so that they could believe. Jesus yet does that today. And if you have doubts about him still, 
Call out to him. Investigate the evidence. See, not just in what is written in the scripture, see about the changed lives even within this room. This is why we give testimony. And this is why we talk about God's deliverance and God's goodness. And this is why we say, God, we prayed and God answered our prayer. And in some things we're still waiting. These things help our unbelief. Observe the creation. Observe the word. Observe the Son, observe the body of Christ, which is His church, and ask. Thomas's statement at the end, and we'll get to this, is profound. My Lord and my God. Now the, sex, the next thing that we see here is that Jesus helps us through our fears. Not only does he meet people in their doubts, he helps us through our fears. Now, did you notice in this passage that the disciples had the doors locked? Right? John made sure to add in that little detail. And by the way, they weren't anticipating any visitors, right? They were afraid of the Jewish leaders, and rightly so, because they killed Jesus, and more than likely, they were coming after those who knew him and followed him. So they were scared of what would happen to them. So then, here is Jesus. So let's talk about what Jesus gives to them and what Jesus gives to us in our places of fear. By the way, have you ever been afraid of anything? Thank you for your honesty. Same, right? <laughs> Worry often is a result of fear. I don't know about this situation with my finances, my children, my body. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or even when I die or on and on and on. We are bent towards fear. Jesus knows that we are prone to fear and he helps us. Doesn't chastise us. How can you dare fear? He says, let me help you. And so this is how he helped these disciples and this is how often he helped us as well. First thing we see in this passage is that Jesus gives us his presence. Don't you like that? The first thing that Jesus did was stand, quote, among them, John 20, 19, even though the doors were locked. And this, by the way, is something only God can do. The truth is that there is no locked room where Jesus cannot enter. Right? There is no jail cell. There's not even a, a belly of a whale that God cannot reach people. The truth is, if you're a Christian, you are never alone. Jesus could reach in any place, any dark place, any desperate place, any place of fear, and he doesn't even need you to open the door. Right? He can speak to anyone at any time for any reason. Do you know why? Because he's God. I like that about him. Regardless of where we are, he can meet us there. And his presence is with us. That's incredible. By the way, fear is a massive theme in the scripture because it's a massive theme with us often. The number one thing that God offers to us to not fear, he doesn't say, hey, don't fear, just you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you know, go for it. He doesn't say that. He says, do not fear. Why? Because I'm with you. Right? That's the reason. And so if you are afraid of whatever, fill in the blank, acknowledge it and say, God, will you show yourself to me in this? Will you help me? through this 
That is a prayer that God will answer. Because he desires to be with us, particular in our fears. Next we see that Jesus gives us peace. As Stephanie pointed out, the very first thing that Jesus said was, peace, (laughs) be with you. And he says it twice because we need to hear it twice. A peace to you. Peace is like a a balm on a place that constantly itches, and once you get some ointment on it, there is peace. He offers that to us. I'm going to assume most of us in this room need more of that. Peace to you. Peace to you. If you notice the letters of Paul, often he starts out or finishes with peace and grace to you. We need those, and Jesus offers them to us. Indeed, yes, sometimes he makes the surroundings peaceful as he steps out and calls to a storm and says, peace to you, and everything calms. Sometimes that happens. And other times the storm continues to rage, but he speaks to you and says, peace to you. I want to ask you to seek his presence, ask for his peace that is beyond all understanding, that would guard, right, guard our minds, guard our hearts, because he helps us. There is no shame in being afraid. Ask the Prince of Peace to help speaks into their circumstances, and then speaks into ours. Third thing we see from this passage, Jesus gives us his purpose, right? And notice the next thing that Jesus does, this is in John 20, 21, is commission them, and in turn commissions us and said, as the Father had sent me, I am sending you. And it's super ironic, right, that Jesus was saying that to a bunch of dudes behind closed doors, right? They were scared. That was probably the last thing they wanted to do. <laughs> you want to send us where? Right? You notice that? It's like, it's like the contrast is pretty stark. Right? Here they are, scared out of their wits. Right? Jesus shows up. Peace, bro. You didn't probably say it like that. But peace right? with you. And by the way, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. They're like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Even in your fear, God's calling and mission for your life is not done. Hear this. There is still a plan. There's still a calling. And we still have an opportunity to bear witness ultimately to Him. Even if we have some doubts. Even if there is some fear. Peace to you, and I'm sending you, just like the Father sent me. There's a lot even in that phrase, if you think about and meditate on how did God send the Son, right? To talk about the kingdom of God, to draw people to repentance and to believe the gospel. As I was sent, Jesus is saying, so I am sending you. If you have breath, you have purpose, Are you hearing me? Don't think I'm too damaged or I'm not knowledgeable enough or I'm not charismatic enough or blah, 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 blah. Stop making excuses. You have a ministry. You have a mission. I'm glad you're clapping. Better yet, I hope you're living. I think people get depressed often because they think they're no good or they have no use. It's a lie from the devil, okay? You have purpose. You have his presence. 
And also you have his power, and we see this next. And this is like a really curious thing, right? He says, hey, I'm sending you, excuse me, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. All right, this is John 20, uh, verse 21. And then in John 20, verse 22, he does a very odd thing. <laughs> he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's a little odd. Right? And thinking about this, this is what comes to mind. Right? You know, there's one other place in Scripture where God breathed on His creation. You know where this is? Thank you. It's in Genesis. Right? Where what is recorded there that God made the first man out of the dust. Right? Beautiful. Majestic. It's incredible what God has done even creating these bodies, but there was no life, and then God breathed, right? and this creation became a living being. That's something God does, breathes, and there is life. This is also something God does, he breathes, and there is new life, making us born again. You catch that. This is, guys, through this belief, I'm doing this act, which is significant, which is symbolic, which is powerful, saying that I'm breathing you now anew, and come to life in this belief, be born again, Nicodemus, right? John chapter 3, making us new again. This is a new creation act by Christ, and saying now that you believe and the Holy Spirit is transforming you and there's going to be an outpouring. We'll read that in Acts, right, of the Holy Spirit coming on. These guys were empowered and equipped to be ambassadors and saying, hey, when you tell my message, if people believe the message, then their sins are forgiving because, forgiven because I'm giving you my authority. Ultimately, God is the one who forgives but he gives us, like an ambassador, this authority to proclaim the message. And if people believe indeed their sins are forgiven, and also if they don't believe indeed their sins are still their own. Right? This is profound and powerful that God entrusts us with his message and gives us his authority to proclaim these things as his ambassador so that people will know and truly receive and truly be forgiven. This is incredible. And he does all of these things to people who have fear. And if you have fear, you are a great candidate for Jesus the Christ. To step into your life, to empower you, to equip you, to calm you, right? to help you. And some of you would say, man, I need some more of that. Ask, and you will receive. Right? You've read that one. This is our Jesus. Steps into our doubts, steps in to our fears calls us, connects us, communicates with us, gives us so many things. This is the risen Christ, do you believe? The last thing we see in this passage, and John has been driving us here for chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. Jesus invites us to believe intentionally lined up for this, even doubting Thomas, right? This statement of his is significant, right? And it's saved for the last or near the end. That here is the risen Christ appearing in his resurrected form, Helping people to believe, inviting them into relationship. And Thomas, once he believes, makes this declaration in verse 28. My Lord and my God. Right? 
He recognizes who this is. This is no mere mortal. This is no moral teacher. This is no gentle healer. He's those things and so much more. He is the Lord. He is God. And Jesus receives this designation. Did you catch that? He doesn't say you should only worship God alone, right? None of that. You should have no other gods before me, right? This is Exodus chapter 20. You remember this? Jesus, in this recognition and declaration, receives this because they know who he is. This is a profound truth by this Jewish Man named Jesus, God in the flesh. Thank you, John, from John chapter 1. This is him, and John just ties these things together. Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? And through the voice of Thomas brings us to an amazing revelation. Indeed, this is, he is God. And I love this, right? In John 20, 29, right? This is Jesus himself. In that space, in that room, saying to those men, because you have seen me, you have believed. And then looks beyond that room into even this very room and all of the rooms and all of the places In the entire world that people will believe. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Which includes you. Which includes me. You recognize that you have been blessed by Christ if you believe. He was thinking of us. Yes, they're in the room, but so many more were in the room, right? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John concludes, and Ken, he concludes this chapter, and in many ways, he concludes the book, right? This would be a great way to just, you know, write the final line. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. This is the point, and you have heard all along in this series, if you've been with us, this is why this book was written, right? This is why we've taken time to look at at it, that we may believe Jesus is the Christ, Son of God, and that by believing you, you, you may have what? Life in His name. I hope, and we're going to have a couple more weeks, right, in this book, right? He could have stopped right here, and there's this little epilogue, right? Well, what about, what about Peter, right? What, what happened to him? And John says, oh yeah, P.S. Let me, let me tell you about Peter. And let me show you some more things about my heart towards him and also those that he reinstates. And oh yeah, follow me. Right? If you have come to faith during this series, we applaud and celebrate with you. And if you are still wondering in your doubts, please continue to investigate. And if you believed in this series from decades ago, right, before any of we talked any about this stuff, I hope that your love for Christ has grown. I hope you love him more and treasure him greater and look to exalt him. <laughs> higher. This helps us as God commissions us with his message because of his great love for us. 
So from this passage, know that Jesus meets us in our doubts, and that may be you today, that may be those who you love that you've been praying for for decades, and I have people I've been praying for for decades. God, meet them in their doubts. Help them to believe. Perhaps again that you are in a place of fear today. Meet with him. Get some prayer today. Know that he meets us or helps us through our fears, providing what is needed to continue moving forward in his purpose. And also know that Jesus invites you to believe. And check this out. Follow him. Join him in his great adventure. Live in Him, live through Him, live because of Him, live for Him. That's walking like a Christian. As I said, in the next couple of weeks, we will um, look at this epilogue, but for now we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for your goodness to us. We believe. God, we do pray for those in our life and in our community who know a lot about you but don't know you. God, will you, even in this season, pierce their doubts and show them the reality of who you are, that you are the Christ, the Son of God. We pray for those in our spheres, God, be it at school or at work or in the neighborhood or in our family or wherever, that they would Taste and see that the Lord is good. That the eyes of the heart would be open and they too would choose to believe. Thank you, God, for meeting us in our doubts and in our fears. Lord, I ask that you would do that even this week, even this hour, God. For those who are here, those who are hearing. God, I ask that we'd see more of your presence, God. Believe to greater and greater degrees. God, we're grateful for your work in us and among us. We're grateful that you thought of us, God. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.